Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey, everybody. This is Tom. Before we jump into today's episode, we wanted to let you know that the leadership seminar, Journey to Industry 4.0, that we will mention in this episode, it had to be postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Check back at digitalenterprisesociety.org for more updates. Now, let's get to today's episode. Hey, welcome to, or welcome back to, the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you very much for coming along on this journey of this show that is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show with Craig Brown. Craig is an industry veteran and a former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm great, Tom. Uh, good to be doing another podcast. I, I enjoy these discussions. And uh, today we're going to go back to manufacturing for a bit <laughs> with some real practical use of digital technologies. Yep, I was noticing we're, we're not quite there yet, but we're coming up on a year of doing this podcast. So we have had a lot of great information that we have shared with people over about the last eight or nine months and a lot more good stuff to come. But today's episode, it's going to be one of those where we talk manufacturing. And Craig and I try every single week to bring to the listeners of this podcast really interesting interviews and other ideas that are going to help everybody enhance and grow their careers. So today we have Isaac Bennett. And Isaac is the head of IT at Detroit Manufacturing Systems. And he is also going to be one of the speakers at an upcoming event, the Leadership Seminar, The Journey to Industry 4.0 that is actually brought to you by the Digital Enterprise Society and IoT Company. For more information on that event, you've got to go over to digitalenterprisesociety.org and learn more. But today, we've got Isaac right here on the podcast. Hey, Isaac, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Tom. It's good to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. So, Isaac, what is your sort of career trajectory? What's your story? Where did you start and, and, and what are you doing now at Detroit Manufacturing Systems? Um, I, like a lot of IT people, um, don't have a degree in IT. Um, I, I fell into it because of my love of technology and innovation. Um, and, and my story from when I was a child was my father was a professor at Michigan State University and, and he um, was one of those professors that was the first people on the internet. So he brought that, uh, the computers home that he was testing out and he dragged the, the, the rotary phone across the room and plugged it into a modem. And uh, <laughs> he heard all the chirping. And then I, I didn't know what I was doing. And my father introduced me uh, to checking scoreboards, you know, all, all text-based internet. <clears throat> when <you're, clears throat> and so the, I didn't even know I was on the internet when I was on the internet. Um, but that, that drew my interest in, in the, the computer world, and, and I fell into IT um, doing help desk work, and I, I really started from the bottom and worked all the way, all the way up through um, where I am today. And <clears throat> one of the uh, interesting uh, parts of my journey has been uh, going from IT um, into kind of a uh, cross-functional role of digital transformation and, uh, you know, really bringing, and, you know, IT is kind of moving into the space of how can we add business value? Mm -hmm. And specifically in my field in manufacturing, um, I, I got the opportunity to work uh, directly with business leaders and also with guys in the plant floor um, for a few years now on how to uh, bring IT to the plant floor, the IT OT convergence um, as what's going on right now. So that's been a, a little recap of my journey so far. So so help the people with the acronyms. So I think most of us get information technology. OT? It's operations technology. So ah. the op operations, plant floor uh, technology. So so like monitoring the flow of material or the machine 
machine uptime or, or whatever the measures exactly. are. Exactly. CNCs, okay. PLCs, you know, how, uh, what are they doing? Um, SCADA systems uh, on the plant floor, how are they uh, collecting that data and how are we then using that through the uh, IT automation pyramid? So, so Isaac, it's, it's, it's nice to chat with you and I, I <laughs> you know, brought up modems. Well, that <laughs> brings back memories. So yeah, I'm, I'm, Maybe not quite as old as your as your father, or maybe I am. But uh, the I used to deal with a modem at three hundred baud, and for the for the people out there, ninety five percent of you that don't know what we're talking about, go Google it. It's in the history books. I gotta but, tell you, I gotta uh, tell you, Craig. I remember being like seven or eight years old. This is the early to mid seventies, and my cousin yeah. worked for a company called Control Data, and he brought a yeah. suitcase to our house. Took the receiver of the rotary phone, put That's it into it. <laughs> this, put it into this contraption that like ate the receiver. It like had the the ear part and the mouth part, and it like went into this. Yeah, you just plugged it in yeah, to yeah. this plastic like mouth of it that sealed it all up, and then he proceeded to type on a keyboard, and it would print out pictures like he we could do a few keystrokes and it would make a Martian, and that's all. I just thought that computers were to make funny pictures with a dot matrix. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it's all kinds of memories. I mean, I, I, uh, well, I, I had to work to get through college, meaning to pay my bills. And, and so my job was my location of my job was about a hundred miles from the university. And the particular company I worked for put, a they called it deck writers. So it sat by itself. It was a keyboard with a dot matrix printer attached to it, hooked to a bunch of digital equipment, which that company's long gone. And, um, <clears throat> Anyways, so thanks for the memory, Isaac. <laughs> yeah, so, no so you're right. And <laughs> the way you debugged a modem is you pulled it out of the socket and you listen. Could you right. hear the chirp, chirp, yeah. chirp, 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 chirp? Yeah, and if you could hear that, the chirping, you knew it was working. If you couldn't hear the chirping, you know, well, it's broken, and you know, and then, call and again, then, and it's just and, like. And then if you have a sister and you're trying to check sports scores and she picks the phone up right in the middle, it causes, oh yeah, to causes, go to make a call, right? <laughs> 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 okay, so we have come a long way because we're no longer doing modems, and and now all of our devices are connected multiple ways to the the internet we have today, which has huge capacity compared to three hundred baud. Um, we don't even use the word baud anymore. But anyways, so so you, you you through your choices, you you've ended up in this IT operational role and and helping run a manufacturing plant a lot of times the journey to digital enterprise comes from manufacturing is is that what um you've seen as well or or, or is it also driven by other parts of the company um that that i mean that is the main driver and mainly because i mean what we do is is we build parts for we're a tier one that builds parts for, for manufacturing so i mean the the um the motivation is how do we make the product in a way that um, is more efficient, more effective, and in and, and the end, it's cheaper for us to make, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's where, that's where the core of the motivation comes from. But I think it comes from both, both ways. Um, and for me, in IT, uh, if I'm going to try to get the business to jump on board with, you know, connecting things together and, and putting sensors on the products, um, I'm going to attack uh, where the best ROI is or, you know, what, what resonates with, with the sea levels and the top level is, is return on investment. And uh, that's, that's kind of where my attack has been. Yeah. yeah and so, so to do that, where, um, how do you go about knowing the best place to, to put in innovation, to put in <laughs> sensing or, or data analytics? It's um. So uh, I, I will give you an example of a, a project that we did, um, actually with IoT Co. <clears throat> we um went into an Akron facility that actually used to be a um, we were making uh, rims at, at the company I was with at the time. So actually, outside of Goodyear, uh, used to be a Goodyear factory. The factory had been there forever. Mm -hmm. Um. So very old equipment in that factory. In fact, I. I think, you know, right after it's, you know, 60, 70, 80 year old equipment in, in some aspect, uh, points. Right. And, and it's not a super complicated uh, process. So it, it, they're roll forming steel, um, they're welding steel. It's not like those machines, those machines are still effective. 
the problem was, you know, getting into that plant um, and, and really finding out at the core, what is the, the problems that you have with that plant? So it is a big concept to just come in there and, and put up uh, PowerPoint slides and say, here's industry 4.0 and here's all the things you can do. But we really wanted to focus on something um, small that was had a, could have a big impact if we were able to fix the problem. And, and you know, as, as I've gone down this journey, um, one of the things that I learned rather quickly was um, to start with something small, um, but then have the idea or the strategy that this is something, if it works, that we could scale across the business rather quickly. Okay. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to turn into a science project uh, yeah. where you're you're just uh, you know throwing money and and. Yeah, it's cool. Technology is cool, right? I like technology. It's the reason I'm in IT. Um, but at the core of it, um, we not, we want to solve a business problem. Mm -hmm. So what we did was these very old machine that was a bottleneck when it broke down, um, we started to sensorize it. And sensors these days, and this is what enabled the manufacturing industry to get into this, is the sensors are pretty inexpensive. Right. So if we put the right sensors in the right areas and we understand the machine and what the problem points are with that particular machine, we went down to the level of saying, okay, on this machine, what particular part of that machine is the problem? And then we just censored that part of the machine instead of just taking the whole machine and throwing sensors on it. We wanted to narrow it down to a very specific problem with a very specific machine, sensorize it, take that data, and now use the internet to throw that into the cloud and into a uh, machine learning um, okay. algorithm. And then uh, see if we can start predicting when that machine is gonna fail. And then and then your uptime uh, for this particular client, then I presume the, the operational uptime improved, right? That was, that was part of why you talked about IT and OT really coming together, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course that affects the bottom line, that's the ROI point, right? So yeah, we, we were on a very strict, you know, talking to the leadership of the company, um, they said, we want to see ROI after, I think it was 12 months. Mm -hmm. We're going to invest this much. How quickly can we see ROI? And, you know, we went to the financial people and, and we uh, made that business case of saying that, yes, we do this project. You know, you broke down this many times last year. This is how much it cost you. Right. We do this project and avoid those breakdowns. We can save you this much money. So I'm, I'm glad an IT guy is saying this on the air because <laughs> because <laughs> um, I, I came on the engineering side and I would deal with lots of folks that would say, well, here's a new, whether they were vendors or IT folks, here's a new thing we should be doing and here's what it might, might save you. Right. And, and, you know, yeah, I, I, I you know, I can just tell you, you don't, you don't make any waves. You don't make any progress on a theory. You, you have to have evidence that it's really going to do it. And it's better to do that in a, in a small, you know, stepwise. And then once you get confidence, well, then they're going to ask you, well, can you go off and solve these other three problems, right? Right. <laughs> yep. Well, interesting. Um, let's talk a bit about supply chain, if, if you don't mind. Um, what, what should the, uh, the customers of, of your company do a little better when it comes to digital enterprise? Is, is there something that's a, you know, top two or top three things you wish the, the car companies or the truck companies would do differently? Um, you know, some people might might uh, jump through this through the radio at me. And, <clears throat> That's okay. We're safe. First, We're all in the digital yeah, universe. They the can't first, find us. <laughs> the first thing that I think of is the EDI. Um, EDI is a solid uh, technology. It works, right? Okay, um, and make, make sure, so we everybody follows, just spell out your is, acronym. What does e EDI stand for? God, I don't even know what it stands for. It, it is the... Uh, You're a true IT guy, but <laughs> I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the way businesses are, are uh, electronic data interchange. Okay. Is the electronic interchange of business information using standardized format. So basically... Uh, you know, yeah. you, you have an ASN or you, or you need to get uh, uh, invoices uh, between businesses, you know, yeah. we, have a, we have a provider that's providing parts to use EDI transfer. It's, it's a very, very old technology. It's been around for 30, 40 years, uh, much like email. But, um, but as far as I know, we're not consistent. I mean, I, 
I know what the GM ones are, but but if you got to deal with yeah, GM and Ford and a, yep. uh, an international harvester, it's probably different, right? And it we, it's as, it's as mundane as the build schedule. How many units do we want on this date? To as complex as uh, oh, don't don't you, you can't send me material from this part of the world, right? Right. Because it's it's not good <laughs> or <Yep>. whatever. <laughs> And we've had discussions internally recently about, you know, is it possible we start using blockchain uh, or ah. open APIs uh, mm -hmm. on, on some of the portals? Uh, you know, you want to do it securely, obviously, and blockchain is, is could be right. the answer for doing that kind of stuff. So, so, I, so do you sense there's a, a move in the, in the supply chain to embrace blockchain? Uh, you know, I, I think it's at the hype stage. You know, you talk about well, yeah, the... <laughs> <laughs> got to do it, man. But it, I, it, it, to your point about security, though, you know, not that long ago, it was point to point, right? So if you wanted to sell us parts, we had to have a point to point connection, right? Right. On the other hand, blockchain lets you take advantage of the internet and still be secure, and it's one of the things it does, right? And so, um, ah, it, it's interesting you're bringing blockchain up. We we haven't heard that much, but I actually think around supply chain integration, I would guess people are working on it. If, if you don't know about it from the tier ones, I would encourage you to reach out. There are people thinking about it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Now, when are they gonna do it? I don't know that. Um, yeah, right. And it's hard It's hard to to move away from something like EDI because it works, right? It's a, it's a very, very basic way to communicate. It's a simple way to communicate and it's effective. Um, so, I mean, if, if, like you said, um, it's not always, uh, there could be more effective ways, I think. Um, from my perspective, I, I think of all the ways that we could be, um, uh, as a tier one um, auto provider, you know, uh, we have providers, uh, you know, sure. that we got to get parts from, tier twos, et cetera. It would be so great if we had like a central portal for all of our providers uh, to, to put all of their, their information and data in, and we could put our requirements there, and then everybody could have this collaboration of, you know, and all Ford, Ford suppliers uh, from DMS go to this portal and you put in, it, there's all your label information, yep. there's your shipping information, there's everything right, right there. I mean, from, from an IT perspective, uh, it, it seems kind of archaic the way we, we are currently doing it. And I, and I understand it's hard to change. I mean, email, I, I my perspective as an IT person, even a former uh, email server administrator, is I think email was going to go away. Yeah, and we get sure. to if you look at the business side of all the collaboration tools that we have now that we can use, and it's tying everything together. I think we can do the same in, in the automotive manufacturing uh, area with our with our providers and our, our customers. You you would think with all this digital technology that that a, book, a group of suppliers, so up and down the supply chain. So I'm glad you brought up tier twos because they have the same problem. They have many of you tier ones that deal with different OEMs. And so if you draw this, this interrelationship diagram, you end up with something that looks like uh, well, spaghetti or a convoluted web, right? And, and just a bit of standardization would make this go much smoother for everybody. And um, probably everybody wins. Everybody could get a little more profit because we wouldn't waste yeah. our time doing data translation all the time. Right. So that, that's a good idea. You know, I, I asked a, a guy from IBM um, who was in a conference about using data analytics to help melt down the silos of data, right? That use slightly different names. And he had an interesting perspective. He, he said, well, that could be a problem we should solve pretty quickly. And I, I hope that happens. So one way you do this is you, you come up with standards, right? And you tell everybody, follow the standard. A different way might be to use machine learning. It, it would be interesting if somebody could pull that off because then, then we don't have to waste this time coming to an agreement on a standard. We could just say, well, yeah, the, the magic translator works. Just trust it, right? It's the Alexa for manufacturing. Yeah, or, did you see maybe. the poster? Do you see the poster behind me? Uh, I don't. And our, 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 no, for sure, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, this, the, I mean, there's not the many viewers videos. can't see it. Yeah, so right. Yeah, it's a it. podcast, but it, but it's, it says um, um, every typo brings us one step closer to the robot revolution. Yeah, right, because so, they're big better, right? They won't know this. this. I mean, especially in manufacturing, uh, sometimes people don't like my perspective, but I'm like, you know, the the one thing that cannot be predicted is human behavior. 
So yeah. I, I like that. I like that perspective If we can use machine learning and AI and understand, you know, what data is important across silos instead of relying on, on standards, people to follow standards. I mean, that solves. solves and especially when in, in this day and age, they should never rekey or re-enter data, but it still goes on because yeah. oh, yeah. the ERP system and the PLM system and the, well, the specific supply chain, not ERP in general for a plant, but but how do we communicate with everybody in this this uh, very complex world of mass production? Um, and, and, and one of the reasons, and one of the reasons I landed at DMS was because of my experience with digital transformation, and they're doing a lot of um, transformation here. I mean, they they were uh, without a PLM, and they're they're bringing in a PLM and they're bringing IT involved in it. And one of my messages that I've been saying over and over and over and over again is, first of all, if you want to be an agile and innovative uh, company that is staying on, on the edge as much as possible, um, we got to we got to look towards uh, software as a service models mm -hmm. right. and subscription models. And then you got to start looking at the um, the models that, that Microsoft has started to embrace um which is a uh, you know generally microsoft in the past um would try to keep their uh ecosystem um intact and not touch anything else right uh, now we're seeing microsoft branch out and say yeah we'll connect to this product we'll connect to that product um so i, I i've been passing that message in the digital age with how fast information is exchanged you can't lock yourself in and you will, you want to try to find those, those vendors and those models where you can connect into the ERPs from the PLM and back to the manufacturing systems. And you want to be able to connect that system together um, and, and try to share data as much as possible. So, so I, I think at the plumbing level, so way down at the data level, I think the, the Microsoft's of the world and there's a couple others, I think they're starting to do that pretty well. Go up one level. Are, are the, PLM solution providers doing well enough or is there stuff you'd like to see them do better? They, uh, they sometimes listen to our podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, I think they uh, are a little bit behind, you know, SAP's SAP is kind of pushing, pushing the edge with their, their cloud, uh, you know, the, their old ECC six SAP version. Um, they're really pushing it that in five years it's gone. And yep. that everybody moves into the cloud. And I was talking to someone the other day who said, um, if if you rest on your laurels right now and think that oh we're a big company and and SAP is going to let us slide, he goes, I think you're going to be wrong. I think SAP is going to start forcing people's hands. But my point being that the PLMs, from what I've seen recently, and we, we did some evaluation of, of, of PLMs, um, they're definitely moving towards the cloud. Uh, but they're not quite getting to the spot of um, this is a complete uh, cloud mm -hmm. solution, SaaS solution, and I, you know, that that could be difficult, especially with engineering data. So, yeah. so I, well, it, it's a there. There's the technology side, then there's the trust side, and that, yeah, yeah, right. I, I was in a debate at, at the the big conference that Siemens runs, uh, Realize Live, and. Um, there was a guy from Amazon there and he was bringing up the, oh yeah, it's gonna be great. We're gonna put everything in the cloud. And I, I gently pointed out to him, or maybe I wasn't so gentle. I said, well, it's not that we don't trust Siemens. We, we have a big relationship with them. We're more worried about what you'll do with our data, right? So yeah, that's right. just, you know, we're big enough. We'll have our own clouds, we still do, right? But but at the end of the day, I, I think this the security of the, the cloud, uh, what I've learned in my, my first year of retirement is, the concern's a bit overstated, and so and so I think I think people have got to got to get in the discussion about you know where is where is cloud technology gone, and how do you make it secure? The the government awarded their their big defense contract for uh, cloud computing and surprised a lot of people by awarding it to Microsoft and not to Amazon. Um, they call it Jedi, but but I think this will help the discussion, right? What do we mean by security? And and it should mean, no kidding, you can't see the shape of the new car that I'm developing that your company's providing a part for. That's right. what's the corporate secret. And and today it's in our servers because we don't trust other people, right? Well, th there's a lot of value in seeing what the new thing's gonna look like and or how it's gonna perform, right? And yeah. so I, I think 
anybody providing software as a service or cloud storage and computing, you got to be able to address that question. How do you still assure the people using your services that their stuff is really secret and stays secret? Right. right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I've had a conversation with a few people and I, my perspective as far as security is concerned is um, I don't have the money or the infrastructure, especially in manufacturing as a mm -hmm. manufacturing facility. I mean, if I was a financial facility, it'd probably be a different story, maybe. but I don't have the type of money to spend on a security system and the, on the front end of my data center that is going to be able to um, compete with the, the security that Azure or Amazon right. has. So from that but, perspective. Yeah, they're yeah. already better. Right. But then, you know, there's a point of view, well, you're not a, a biggest target uh, as Amazon. and, and, and <laughs> So, I mean, there, there's two levels of the argument. And then that's yeah. also, as you mentioned, I mean, companies, you know, what are they, gonna, how are they going to use your data? What's in the agreement? Right. Uh, what can they use your data for, you know, uh, advertising and, and other things? I mean, is that part of the, uh, the conversation as well? Well, just, just everybody remember, right? Why is it the Googles and the Amazons and the Microsofts are doing what they do with machine learning and data? It's really simple, everybody. They needed data in order to tune their algorithms, to listening. tune their AI. And so if you ever get confused about why are they offering all this, it's because they really do want access to the data, not, not so much to steal your secret, but to tune their algorithms for, and you know, it's, it's not wrong. It just is the way it is. But a lot of times people forget the, the fundamental motivation. The guys that founded Google, they, they had an interview, I don't know, over a decade ago now, probably. And they just turned to the interviewer and said, you should understand it's about um, artificial intelligence. It's about improving the state of the art. We need data. So a manufacturing plant or, or even a products company that, that has something like, uh, well, like what we, we have at GM OnStar in the car, we're already collecting lots of data. Plants are collecting data. Cars are collecting data. Your cell phone collects more data than you really want to know. <laughs> right. And so the collection of data is just as important in, in producing machine learning and the ability to do predictive analytics. Um, and, and I think um, that's, that's one of the things that fascinates me. And, and you talked about being a youngster and seeing computers. It is amazing how computers can augment our lives. And, and I don't mean replace us, you know, robots should do all the boring uh, repetitive jobs. They really should. We, we should be free to go to use our minds and, you know, do the fun stuff and do the stuff that isn't so obvious to a, to a machine. So anyways, Isaac, you're giving a paper here in a few weeks um, later in the spring about um, um, at this new event that the Digital Enterprise Society and IoT are sponsoring. Could you give us a, a bit of an overview of what's going to be in the paper? Um, some of the stuff that, that I discussed will be in there, but um, really I, the thing that I run into the most as I uh, talk to people about their journey in, in digital uh, manufacturing and smart manufacturing is there's a lot of people who have run into it and they don't know uh, where to start. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I have done, I've been doing this for about five years. And when I started, I was the same way. Um, it's a big, big animal and um, you got to figure out where to start. So I really like to tell the story of, you know, how, how do you, what do you tackle first? What do you look for? And how do you, um, show the business value um, quickly and efficiently. And that's a lot of stuff that I'm gonna talk about um, with that paper and, and conference. Interesting. So, so I, I think people should attend. It's gonna be here in the Detroit area. Um, the dates and details are to be published shortly. Um, and um, Isaac, it's been a joy chatting with you. Tom, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, no, Isaac, thank you very much. And one of the things I try to do before we let really smart people like you leave this podcast is I like to sort of circle this all back to the listener because our goal is to help them enhance and grow their careers. So you talked about a lot of interesting stuff. And one of the things I loved in your introduction is you talked about as head of IT, you saw yourself sort of in this world of IT meets digital transformation. And then a little bit later, you said something that tied back to that that I thought was cool. And I'm going to probably misquote you a little bit, but you said, I like technology, it's cool, but in the end, we need to solve a business problem. So yep. for the people who are listening, who are in either sort of an IT related career, 
or they're in that PLM space. What advice do you have for people as far as sort of how do they find the problems to solve? What, what can people be doing to make sure they're not just playing with cool tools? Yeah, I, I throughout my IT career, you can, you can throw software at any problem, um, but the software only works as good as your process and your people. So getting the proper training and, and so I would tell them start with the with the people and the process. Make sure you have the right people in place. Make sure whatever department you're in that you understand your process and you have the workflow because when you do that, you will understand where your bottlenecks are and where your problems are. And I did this uh, with a couple plants. We just did a workflow of their entire process. We talked about every step and why do you have a, what problems do you have in this step, what problems do you have in the next step. And then it gives you a really good idea of how to connect things together and what problems to tackle. And if you understand your process and your problem and your people, then you look at the, the technology and say, okay, here's my three top problems. What is the best technology to solve that problem? Yeah, that's excellent, Isaac. Um, value stream mapping, which is a general way to describe this, is yep. we, we've talked about it a few times, and I'm, I'm glad you went back there. Uh, it really is the way to figure out meaningful change, and, um, and then leadership will see the value of the first one, and before you know it, you'll have five projects. So nice, yep. nice closing. <laughs> awesome. And again, thanks to Isaac Bennett uh, from Detroit Manufacturing Systems for joining us here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Now, remember, Craig and I are here once a week with interviews with really cool people like Isaac. So make sure that you join us so that you'll get more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.